This is Forum. I'm John Michaels, Public Affairs uh, Radio Director since 1977. I think this is week 2,195 or something like that, uh, talking to Mayor Candidate David Zokaitis. Here I am. And known as David Z. And uh, I didn't recognize you. You cut your hair. My daughters talked me into it. They want me to look more professional and more mayoral and, and less okay. like they're... Well, I, I guess, you know, we had you on, uh, oh, I don't know, about six months ago. Uh, since then, you you have a license plate that says uh, mayor, doesn't it? Isn't that awesome? I do. <laughs> <laughs> that is my legal South Dakota license plate, M-A-Y-O-R, mayor. Well, you've had uh, quite a few debates uh, and, you know, coffees and those kind of things under your belt now. What are your specific goals now as mayor? My, oh, I, you know, I have so many goals, I had to write them all down and put them on my flyer. Well, what are they? Some of my specific goals are to increase transparency in government. Okay. Anything that we can publish as mayor, we're, we're going to publish. We don't need secrecy for anything. Another goal that we have is to try to clean up our road, as roads and make them smoother. But that's going to take some money or, or a labor source. So I'm looking up on the hill, and there's all these poor people in the pen with nothing to do and no way to, to better themselves. And I figure, hey. Let's get them some education, some training, some counseling, and get them out of there and on the roads and making our world a better place. And even after that, we've got a lot of good ideas. We've got a police department that could use a little bit of help and guidance and better community relationships. And oh, that'll be just a wonderful improvement. Well, how would you pay for all these ideas? Well, you got to be careful with what you're going to try to do as mayor because we've got limited resources. So some of those goals that I just talked about don't take any more money. Like, like if you want to build relationships between s citizens and police, you just get them out of the cars and talk to people. And then you, you help people interact, interact in, in a calm, reasonable, respectful manner. That doesn't take any money. It just cha takes a change of focus. Well, who would that help? Oh, my golly, that would help, that would help absolutely everybody. A lot of issues take money from one group and give it to another group. So you've got to be really careful about describing your goals and your aspirations and who you're going to help a little bit and who you're going to hurt a little bit. But getting police out of the cars and talking to people, I don't see how there's going to be any losers in that one. Well, who would they hurt? you got to take the money from somewhere. Well, not in that one. But in some other, um, if you're going to subsidize businesses moving into your town, well, then you've got a shift of resources from one, one group to another. We've got uh, a regressive taxation system here in South Dakota in which poor people pay a greater percentage of their taxes, of their income and in taxes, than rich people do. So if you take that money and give it to, say, rich businessmen to move their businesses, while well, you're taking money from poor people and giving it to rich people in the hope that that builds an economic growth and gets the city to grow better. But in the short term, you're taking money from poor people and giving it to rich people, and I don't really like that very much. Well, there's seven of you running for mayor. We'll see who gets all the petitions in on February 23rd. The vote, of course, is April 10th. But uh, campaign contributions, a lot of times the one with the most money has an advantage, don't they? The one with the most money has a huge advantage. And it's really hard. I wish we would make for public funding of elections so that we could eliminate that advantage. Everybody on the same page. Yeah. Everybody on the same page. And one of the problems that you have with so much money coming into elections is that politicians have to effectively sell their soul and they're selling their services to the highest bidder. And making life a little more difficult, people are often not aware of what they're really doing and why. And so you've got politicians who are working for rich campaign contributors and not really even noticing it and fibbing to themselves. And then the next thing you know, they're going to be lying to the electoral, the voters here, and telling us total nonsense with no intention of ever carrying through with that. Well, I ask everybody, uh, all uh, the candidates, uh, do you think the city is being run by developers or by the uh, citizen right now? I look at a number of problems that show undue influence by developers. Right here on 14th, when you're driving down the road, you see a nice brick building and then it's some weird modern thing that's way too close to the sidewalk and doesn't fit in with the, the structure next to it whatsoever. It looks like that the developer had too much influence. I was at a city council meeting one time where somebody on the zoning board or a similar city board said, we had to roll back our requirements because the developers complained too much. Well, that's a dead giveaway. 
And then if you look at this um, fancy new structure going on, the, this, this monster house in McKinnon Park, it looks like it was approved in violation of a number of city ordinances and zoning requirements. But the developers say, hey, you know, the developers got their way, and now it, the thing's got to come down according to the South Dakota Supreme Court. It's not whether you're a taxpayer, it's who you are that you see. Uh, how would you fix corruption? Well, one way to fix corruption is to notice its existence. And not, another thing that really helps is to open up the doors and, and take down the walls and publish everything you possibly can. When the, the, when the city and the mayor make all these secret deals with secret bids and secret processes, well, that's just a way to let all manner of corruption flow into town. And if you change those processes, if you open things up, well, then you don't have any problems with corruption. Another way to change corruption is by um, not taking campaign contributors by billionaires who want to make millions from your campaign. I think if you follow the money, who gets the most tips from the government? Uh, it's not the small businessman, is it? No, we've got a policy that generates income inequality and wealth inequality and wealth accumulation due in large measure to who pays the biggest bribes, a.k.a. campaign contributions. Well, we have uh, one of our largest, uh, uh, you might say, most visible uh, employers uh, is the prison up on top of the hill. And uh, some are saying we have the world's highest prison rate. I checked on Wikipedia, and it looks like we're either number one or number two in prisoners per capita. When you hear that kind of a statistic, it should send cold, nasty shivers down your spine because that's the kind of problem that you should have in a dictatorship, maybe in Soviet Russia, but not in the land of the free and home of the brave. When there is that many people in prison, it shows that there is something very fundamental and very wrong in our culture. Something is wrong, and we need to figure out what it is and how to solve it. Well, how would you solve it? Well, one of the biggest inducements to incarceration is this horrible war on drugs. And people want to pretend that drug prohibition was motivated by a desire to, to improve public health, but that's completely and totally erroneous. Drug prohibition started in the 30s as a result of racism, but even further, trying to dig deep to the underlying causes, marijuana was prohibited to promote corporate greed and corruption. We had some issues with hemp pulp paper trying to compete with tree pulp paper. And the people who had money said, hey, we're going to put a stop to this idea. So they demonized marijuana, blamed a lot of that problem on Mexican immigrants. Oh, and don't forget blaming it on the Negroes and their satanic jazz. And the next thing we knew, we had marijuana prohibition for decades. And President Nixon, with his policy advisor, boosted up the war on drugs a couple of notches based on more need for dominance and control and more racism. I've got a couple of really horrible quotes from these characters, and l let me read them for you. Here, here's one from Harry J. Anslinger, circa 1930. Marijuana is a shortcut to the insane asylum. Smoke marijuana cigarettes for a month, and what was once your brain will be nothing but a storehouse of horrid specters. Hashish makes a murderer who kills for the love of killing out of the mildest mannered man. Total lies, total nonsense, but used to promote marijuana prohibition. Here's another one of his lies. There are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the U.S., and most are Negroes, Hispanic, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing results from marijuana use. This marijuana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and others. It's these kind of lies that really motivated marijuana prohibition. And here's some garbage from John Ehrlichman, Nixon's policies chief. The Nixon campaign had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. By getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Well, we're budgeted for time. I'm sorry, David Zakaitis. Uh, what would be the thing if I say David Zakaitis running for mayor of Sioux Falls? What do you want people to think? Government for we the people. 
All right. David Zakaitis, one of seven running for mayor of Sioux Falls, I want to thank you for being with us on Forum. Thank you very much, Don. A pleasure.